women will generally have an interdependent self-control. So they'll define themselves in relation to other people. So they'll go, um, I- I'm a mum, I- I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, uh, and uh, I'm, I run marketing here. But it's about relationships. It's how they relate to others. Men will generally have an independent self-control. So they'll describe themselves as going, oh, I'm head of compliance at so-and-so. I run uh, a keen runner. I run a marathon in such and such time. Uh, I was, you know, Hall of Fame baseball player in my house. They'll, they'll say these things, right? And so often their identity is tied up with achievement and it's not, it's not, they don't identify themselves through relationships. Now, I think often that's because we don't necessarily spend time reflecting on who we are, what we want. And in in the absence of knowing that, and sometimes in the absence of relationships, work is almost an escape. Work gives you a narrative. Work gives you an identity. But it's really interesting. If you look at research around when men retire, they often have really bad mental health problems because that identity has gone and they go, I don't know who I am. Welcome to It Gets Late Early. Today I have Max Dickens with me, who is doing something really impressive out there. And I say that because he's pushing back against what has typically been somewhat of a taboo in culture. He's talking about male friendship, which is something that doesn't get a lot of airtime, but really, really should in this era where loneliness is at an all-time high, particularly for the male gender. So welcome, Max. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're a guy after my own heart because we're out here talking about things that, you know, people really kind of push to the side slash uh, don't want to even acknowledge. And it's not exactly, you know, hot to talk about getting older. <laughs> so you're you're out there with me doing this kind of work. And I, I think it really matters. So I'm very happy to have you here. Yeah. And it's um, interesting in terms of the connection, I think, between friendship or loneliness, however you want to phrase the, the issue and getting older. A lot of these things are connected to different times of our life and different pressures we might face at different times. So I think this conversation is going to be really interconnected. Absolutely. I mean, and life and work are almost imperceptible at some at some points now, especially now that there's so much more remote work in the world and what have you. Um, But you wrote a really excellent book. And I'm sadly, because I'm so ADHD, I haven't completed it yet. I'm about I would say a quarter of the way through, and I absolutely love it. You talk about such important things and so much of it is resonant and I know our audience is going to love it. Um, Tell us a little bit about what made you set off on the journey to start writing this book. So the book's called Billy No Mates, How I Realized Men Have a Friendship Problem. And it started with a personal realization, one I wish I didn't have, but I did, (laughs) which was that um, I was planning on proposing to my girlfriend Naomi went as far as shopping for a engagement ring I took a couple of female pals along for moral support and afterwards we'd been in the shop I bought the ring and they said so Max right this is going to happen now you got to think about <laughs> what's next who you're going to have as your best man and my sort of my mind went blank and I was just you know thinking oh I've had a couple of drinks maybe that's what's going on <laughs> and I went home got a pad of paper out and a pen I tried to make a list of men I would be comfortable asking to be my best man and I took way longer than I was expecting and I looked down the list but (laughs) half of them I work with and they might do it but they'd be a bit like okay really uh yeah sure and the other half of these guys I hadn't seen for you know two three years and I thought whoa where have all my male friends gone like what's going on like if you think about loneliness loneliness doesn't look like me you know i'm a pretty outgoing guy i'm quick to buy my round in the bar um <laughs> it's not meant to happen to people like me but increasingly it is and when i googled it like you get a personal problem you straight away jump on google and like <laughs> yeah hope, i would never know, want I'm... anyone to see my search history <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it's a great way of delving into people's subconscious i mean therapists so- should stop <laughs> analyzing dreams and they should just dig out your search history i think it's <laughs> So right. It's it's like a Rolf Charles test, isn't it, basically? Um, <laughs> but anyway, I found so many other guys were having it. Like if there's something like 300 million different results on Google for getting married, no best man. And a lot of it is posts on wedding website forums from grooms who have got this date coming up and they're going, 
you know, I've, if I look at my life, I've got a beautiful partner who I love. I've got a home I'm lucky enough to have. I've got a job I enjoy, but I haven't got any friends. I haven't got any close friends and I'm embarrassed by it. And I don't know how I've got here. And if you look at the stats, I mean, it's a big bit of research came out of the US uh, about this time last year that the number of men reporting they've got no close friends at all has increased fivefold since 1990. So 1993% percent of guys say, I haven't got any close friends. Now it's 15%. Similar stats in the UK. And so what's going on and what can men do about it? So I've sought to answer this question for guys generally, but also selfishly for myself because I did need to find a best man. <laughs> <laughs> and were you successful? Well, I was successful, but there's a twist in the tale, oh, which maybe we'll get to at the end of the podcast, okay. or maybe okay. we'll get to well, when your brilliant listeners read the book. But the, Excellent. But this stuff works. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't wait to get to the end of the book because like I said, it's fantastic. It's hilarious too. Like <laughs> I was cracking up throughout it. And just the way you you show all the different pieces of your life throughout and the way you interweave stories that you have behind the scenes with Naomi and coming to realization. It's just, it's so good. I love it. So I'm, I'm glad you found it funny because I think it's important, especially when you're trying to get guys to engage in this stuff that you you make it fun to read or you make it funny a lot of friendship and how guys are together is funny in, in and of itself but if you think I'll, i wanted to write a book about modern masculinity which i would actually want to read and i found a lot of the ones on the shelves or a lot of the articles i'd read they felt a bit worthy or they felt like you were a good man or you were harvey weinstein there was kind of nothing you know <laughs> nothing in between nothing in between and Kind of the concept I kind of relate to, I call it the in-between man. Like, mm. I'm not like my dad. I'm not like my granddad. You know, they're not bad guys, but I'm not like old school masculinity. But I'm mm. not kind of archetypal new man, which what even is that? We kind of have this right. e-fit version of what it's it is confusing. that we kind of collect through culture. Yeah. And I'm not quite that. I'm kind of in the middle and I'm doing my best, but sometimes I don't have the skills or sometimes have a bit internal conflicts about what, how I should behave. And I think this right. conversation about masculinity plays out so much in our friendships, in our relationships. And so I think 100%. when guys have read my book and fed back, they've gone, oh, I didn't really think of masculinity as being about me. I thought about these all these other guys like Harvey Weinstein. But now <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, it is strange how I am when I'm having a beer with a friend of mine. Like, why do I behave like that? Yes. That's kind of what masculinity is, right? Where do we learn those yes. rules? And have we ever chosen them? I mean, it's just, it's just a really useful door into that conversation. It is. And you pointed out the banter thing, right? And I wanted to talk to you about that because I've witnessed this in my own friendships with men and witnessing what they're doing with their other guy friends, right? And they're very different with me as friends than they are out in the world with their friends who are men. And it it blows my mind. They can be vulnerable with me. They can open up. They can share. We can be super tight. And then I see them out with their guy friends who are allegedly some of their closest friends. And it's like, beer and football and that's it and it, it, it i'm like is there more like have you ever shared anything else with these guys that you would share with me it, it's very interesting to me and i know you talk about that in the book so can you shed a little light on why men have this ability to engage with women in a way that they don't with one another yeah i mean the the, the simple answer is that masculinity so how we go about being guys is a to an extent a performance and we will perform it slightly differently depending on the audience and so with women we feel we can behave a certain way that maybe we can't do with the guys because you know they'll take the piss out of us they'll they'll we'll kind of get embarrassed in some way or it will will emasculate ourselves by talking about certain things and, you know, I've certainly, it was true of me when I was writing the book, realizing that my closest friends were women for this reason. And a lot of guys have fed back the same thing. Like, oh, I'll only talk to my girl mates about these things, but not my boy mates. But I think banter and this kind of dynamic is complex because in a sense, one thing that when men say, you know what, I don't have as many male friends as I used to, but what I miss is the banter. And it's in itself is a sign of intimacy. 
and it can look perverse from the outside like these guys are just breaking each other's balls. Right, They're right. being horrible <laughs> to each other. It's like, just piling on, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what are they getting out of this? But That's actually, I mean, kind of the way I, I think I summed it up in the book was there was an iPhone advert once, and the advert was, you know, different shots of iPhone being like run over by a car, dropped in a <laughs> bath, thrown against a wall, like mauled by a dog. Sounds like the journey of my iPhone. <laughs> yeah. But like the kind of the, the kind of the punch run of the ad was like this iPhone, you know, is going to survive. Right. <laughs> and I think it's the same with like if, how men are together. It's, it's the intimacy is that it will survive all this. And that's why we know it's strong, right? It, we're proving wow. it's strong. And so I don't think we should completely go, this is, you know, problematic. Right. Because there's a lot in it that men love and that is valuable and that is intimate. The I mean, banter's the, fun. It's fun. It's fun. And and girls actually, like it too. Girls do it too. It, oh, absolutely. <laughs> but and and when you what, kind of one of the strange things when I was I spoke to loads of psychologists and writing the book, the psychologist would say to me, the reason why men don't have close friends is they can't collect to each other on an intimate level. They can't be vulnerable with each other. And these kind of archetypal, classically feminine, female behaviors, that's what men can't do. But then I'd talk to loads of women and women would say, do you know what? My best friends, I like hanging out with guys more than girls. And they say, mm. why do you like hanging out with guys? It's like, everything's a joke. Um, yes. They're absolutely yes. brutal. Um, it's simple. There's not too much like emotional heaviness or weight. So we just get so on with true. it. We play games all the time. So oddly, women would say men's so-called greatest weakness was their greatest strength so this stuff yeah. is complex it and, so is <laughs> and it depends on the context yeah right? so Absolutely. the question like the kind of the mirror back to guys and what i've kind of thought about is you need different tools in the box and you just need to have variety mm. it's what i struggle with with guys was the absolute relentlessness of it especially when you're a bit younger your teens 20s it's just this tone all the time and and often guys because humor is so central to how men relate to each other women do it too i'm not saying women aren't funny <laughs> i just want to be clear about that <laughs> right. but guys it's really important with guys. humor is so central and I've seen often that. the humor is like a constant irony so you're never quite yeah. sincere and exactly. that can be a bit right can be fun but <laughs> if you're insincere all the time if you're relentlessly taking the piss all the time what that does is it changes the permissions between you. I, I feel like, do you know, I don't have permission to show certain sides of myself. Therefore, I won't. Therefore, you only get part of me. Therefore, we don't really, we're mates, but we don't really have that close intimacy because you'll never see that from me. Yeah, so, you so don't know that. each other. Yeah. So it's about being able to go in both directions and picking your contexts and your moments. Right. And I, I think this is connected we're kind of obsessed as a culture to link everything back to mass ma gender, masculinity, femininity, hmm. and this idea that it's socialized and learned and performed and that you change how you bring up boys or they'll be completely different when they're adults. There's kind of, there's some truth in it, but I think one thing we're really missing is the fact that context is really important to how we behave. And where do you guys often socialize? They'll often socialize in bars, uh, mm -hmm. around sports, in big groups these spaces don't lend themselves to showing certain parts of yourself so no. there's kind of a lot going on like how we've learned how to be together um the context we generally hang out a lot of this stuff is blocking off uh different ways of being close and it kind of comes under the header for me banter which is like that male way of relating like how we the measuring stick of our time together was was our laugh right yeah, and, and how difficult for unfunny men. <laughs> like, if you happen just not to be witty, like, what do you do? <laughs> what if you're super introverted and, and you can't connect with men? I think that sounds just like, I mean, I think we need to do better as a society and allow people the permission to be themselves and to be different than that. That sounds, ex I, I'm just getting anxiety thinking about what it would be like to be an unfunny man. <laughs> My gosh. But then there are different, you're right, and that there are definitely this is true for femininity and masculinity. And like I've been in another project, I've been writing about like high school and mm, you get to high glory school. Days. You, you go from <laughs> right being that an amorphous kid. You're just a kid. You're a boy mm -hmm. or you're a girl. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all kids. And then you get into high school and suddenly you're not just John, Sarah, Riz, whatever. You then 
get in a tribe. You kind of mm. coalesce into groups and you yeah. become an identity. You're a jock. You're a, you're a nerd. You're an emo, <laughs> right? This And you kind of go, this is me now. You're a floater. But, yeah, yeah. But I was a floater as well, actually. <laughs> me too. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> so, so that means we've got no identity. We've got no personality. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> Chameleons. But, yeah, these different groups have hierarchies, and we know what this is the whole kind of premise of high school movies. And I've got to say, oh my God, in, the, yes. in the UK, we absorb the we you know we watch all these movies, but the kind of premise is they're like morality tales, right? Like it's the prom is. Do you get asked out by the jocks? Do like the jerks who are jocks end up, you know, it's kind of inverted by the end and actually the nice guys have won. They're kind of morality <laughs> tales. But we sense at school that certain sorts of masculinity are just more valued and more respected. Yes. And I think a lot of those masculinities are around quite aggressive, bantery yeah. behaviours. And it's yeah. hard to unlearn that i think to an extent it's true for men and women but we kind of we've survived high school and then a lot of guys <laughs> never kind of moved past it no right? the, the glory days and i didn't go to a co-ed i went to an all-boys school which was like guys oh, wow. squared so you can imagine yeah. some of the things i learned there so so much of the oh. book is about going oh this is why i'm like how i am ah. <laughs> yeah this isn't normal. Yeah, that's that's so entertaining. Um, tell me a little bit about how you think this translates into the world of work, because you know now we spend, and I know you talk about this in the book as well, how you kind of devoted all of your energy in your life to your job, to work. And I feel like I've seen this at play with other men in my life, and I've seen it become their entire identity. And I just, it, it's interesting to me because I almost wonder, like, what are, what's the mask here? Like, why is this something that men do that they just kind of burrow their themselves in this concept that they have to just be all about work? And is it to escape certain feeling? I, I mean, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about that. So the first thing to say is that the number one limitation in our friendships is time. You cannot cheat time. Um, there is a certain amount of time it takes to make a new friend, a certain amount of time you have to see someone to maintain a friendship, a certain level of closeness. I could go into all the science of that. It's just a fact. If you have less time, you're going to have less close friendships and your friendship circle will will shrink. It's just unfortunately a fact. But life is about trade-offs, right? So if you choose to make uh, your, your job the most important thing in your life, you just have to be self-aware that there is a trade-off there and it's gonna you're going to pay a price in your personal relationships. Now, there's no value judgment here. You may choose that that's what you want to do with your life. You may choose at a certain part of your life that you need to do it. But we have to be honest that there are trade-offs. And I would say the way it connects to men is have we actively chosen that or is it something we're doing because we feel we have to prove something? So... There's a really interesting bit of research, psychological research. It's in the second chapter of my book um, around self-construal. So self-construal is you ask people, how would you describe yourself? Or they'll often say, bring in some photos and talk to us about why you chose the photo because it shows who you are. And they get men and women to do it. Women will generally have an interdependent self-construal. So they'll define themselves in relation to other people. So they'll go, um, I I'm a mum, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, uh, and uh, I'm, I run marketing here, but it's about relationships. It's how they relate to others. Men will generally have an independent self-construal, so they describe themselves as going, oh, I'm head of compliance at so-and-so. I run uh, a keen runner. I run a marathon in such and such time. Uh, I was, you know, a Hall of Fame baseball player <laughs> in my eyes. They'll, they'll say these things, right? And so often their identity is tied up with achievement and it's not it's not they don't identify themselves through relationships now i think often that's because we don't necessarily spend time reflecting on who we are what we want and in in the absence of knowing that and sometimes in the absence of relationships work is almost an escape. Work gives you a narrative. Work gives you an identity. But it's really interesting. If you look at research around when men retire, 
they often have really bad mental health problems because that identity has gone and they go, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I care about. I don't know what my values are. I have not invested in my relationships, so I'm lonely. I'm disconnected. So these are things worth thinking about is going, I'm not saying work's not important. Work's really important to me. I realize it become far too dominant to the expense, to, to the, it was costing me relationships, but I had not done the work of going, why am I so obsessed with work? Is it, what am I running from? I think often men who are unhappy or if they're lost, they'll go to alcohol, drugs, but another addiction, which is kind of socially um, validated is work. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. And what you spoke about with regard to the retire- retirement age men, it concerns me too, because especially when you consider the fact that it's harder to get a job when you're over 50 for anybody of any gender, it, it concerns me to consider that some people will be kind of forced off into an earlier retirement or have you know an extended period where they're unemployed. And to think about the, the mental health degradation that could befall, especially men in those circumstances, it kind of breaks my heart. Um, I, I just, I wonder what we can do better as a society to support men through these transitions and help them tap into these parts of themselves that are a little bit more um, traditionally unmasculine. So, I mean, there's things we can do to, to, to support men, which maybe I'll come on to, but I think it's important to kind of say that there's lots that men can do for themselves. <laughs> and often what goes wrong is we outsource our social life to the closest women in our lives, normally our wives. And yes. <laughs> if you look at bereavement and divorce, men suffer worse mental and physical health outcomes than women because they don't have their own social circle. It's been, you know, if they just borrow their partners. So you, we can do more work. We can be more intentional about it. I spoke to a guy I know who's got loads of friends. And I said to him, what's your secret? Like, how come you got so many male friends? He said, well, my friends call me the Sherpa. I like those <laughs> Nepalese soldiers that carry everything up the mountain. They call me the Sherpa because I organize everything. But if I didn't organize everything, we'd never see each other. And I thought that is a great little metaphor for what you need to do in your so- social life. You've got to be the Sherpa. Be the guy that sends the text, organizes the meetup, checks in. You've got to take some responsibility for it and be intentional. If you imagine your life like a lazy Susan, You've got your career on there, (laughs) got your marriage, got your children, got your fitness. Your social life has to be on there because it is so central to mental, physical health, um, emotional health. But we have to manage it. It has to be something you prioritize. So we can do things, but we do have to put some effort and thought into it. In terms of what society can do, I think a lot of it is around – I think a, a lot of these kind of rules about how men are meant to be with one another are softening and they're changing and those messages are changing. But actually these stats around men and friendship loneliness, they're getting worse. So I actually think we need to not put so much focus on societal messaging and culture and think about how does socializing actually happen? And it happens often because we're in what's known as third spaces, work, (laughs) home, Third spaces, your church, um, your your local coffee shop, your local library, um, your CrossFit gym, whatever it is, we make friends in these spaces where we show up to regularly with people who are like us and we have collisions. These third spaces in their like, in in, in their number, in their spirit have been in decline for decades and they are the sort of spaces where men will do socializing, which is in their image. Men tend to socialize around activities, around third things, right? Mm -hmm. And they need a reason to show up and socialize. Men won't just go, hey, do you want to have a chat? (laughs) <laughs> they just don't but say, it's hey. inconceivable for that to be yeah i'm like i'm thinking of my husband here i cannot imagine him doing that do you want to come around on sunday we're watching the football uh i'm gonna do a barbecue yeah sure mm-hmm. i'll see you there right yep but mm-hmm. these spaces are in decline and also <laughs> other societal factors like there's been a lot of urban sprawl to so think about where you live in relation to your friends often we live miles from our friends now yeah. we live miles from the office we're losing time in commutes we're moving away from one another so these things need to change in order to make socializing easy because men don't show the same social initiative as women so these kind of societal changes that impact everyone 
compound for men because they exaggerate our lack of social initiative and our comparative, arguably, lack of social skill in comparison to women. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about the third place, I just I feel like that's been even more obliterated since the pandemic. Right. So we're still trying to dig ourselves out of that PTSD. Right. Like, ooh, it's it's a rough one out there. It really yeah, is. The pandemic got us out of a lot of habits. Mm-hmm. So suddenly getting back into that rhythm. So I often talk about friendships having a rhythm. So, you know, I'd see, I'd organize it, you'd show up, we'd see each other and then you'd reciprocate and we're kind of make sure we do it every couple of months. Like it's a rhythm and I'm used to doing it. It's, it's something I'm, it's, it's just part of my life. When I'm out of it, getting back into it feels like a much bigger deal. Yeah. And we it's like stopping the gym, habits. starting the gym again, right? Like it's like getting out of shape and trying to head back in. Right. Yeah. And I think also what happened with COVID is that there's a lot more, technological mediated relationships and the thing about technology is you can opt out of whatever you don't want to do you can opt out of compromise out of social awkwardness out of having (laughs) to show up right you can always there'll always be a plausible bit of deniability about why you can't go and if you're sat on the sofa and you're watching netflix you can just cancel last minute on whatsapp and i think (laughs) what happens is we the, the old habits and and the old kind of confronting the fact that sometimes socializing isn't always on your terms sometimes it can be a bit awkward sometimes uh, you do have to go out of your way and it can be a bit inconvenient that used to be completely understood and built into what it was but now we step away from that and we expect it to be as convenient as everything else we do online that's true and it just simply isn't there are too many factors in play (laughs) so i'd love to know how can you how can you help people out here? How how can you get people to become either become the Sherpa or foster someone else in their community who is a Sherpa? I want to know about that. So I think the biggest thing is to take some pressure off, right? So if the goal is to make some new friends, you don't do that by waking up and going, I really want to make a friend. I mean, that is like going to inhibit you. <laughs> And you're going to go it's out like, with an energy that's a bit weird, right? It's um, like dating. Yeah. You've got to play hard to get here a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. And I've also, like, dating's maybe a good example. So, like, I've always met women through doing things that I like. And I've kind of been in a space with someone, seen them across the room, but we're kind of sharing something that we enjoy. So we quite like to be similar. And then a conversation happens, and then it's like, oh, maybe we should have a drink. It's kind of not a pressure. I'm not going out to a bar and a woman having a cocktail with a friend and I'm kind of sweating, being like, oh my God, here's all the pressure. Okay, and they're going, this guy could be a creep. Like, this, that's not happening. As the analogy, I think my biggest advice is for guys, and this is going to sound so simple, but think about what you enjoy, what you want to learn, or what you used to do lots of, but maybe you let drop, like a hobby you used to love and you let drop. Ask yourself, where are people meeting regularly to do or learn this thing and then find find that space and show up to it regularly so it's the consistency is so important in friendship making you've got to show up consistently similarity is really important in terms of building relationships but finding these spaces is the biggest thing and especially if you're busy think about maybe it's something to do with health and fitness maybe it's a, a hobby you want to do like for me um, I joined, so I, I joined a CrossFit gym when I moved to a new area. I'm not that guy. I'm not like culty CrossFit. <laughs> I was going to say, chip. are you a part of that? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. That does really cult. annoy me, but people often go like, you do CrossFit. I'm like, yeah, I do. I go four times a week. I know you can't tell, but I do. <laughs> but, but I joined this gym called, called Motion, right? And I kept on showing up and eventually a guy shuffles up to me and goes, Hey, um, you look like you don't love the gym. I'm like, no, I don't really love the gym. Is that Lots of people don't you love the gym. Like, that's so obnoxious. <laughs> the guy, no, the guy. I mean, it, was, it was in the UK, so we, we all hate, uh, hate ourselves, so it was kind of normal. And then um, <laughs> so he said, we'll add you to this, WhatsApp, like this, this kind of splinter WhatsApp group from the main gym WhatsApp group. So the gym's called Motion. This WhatsApp group's called Slow Motion. And it's just guys mm-hmm. that don't, they don't dig like the gym as much as everyone else. And we'll, we'll go and meet. We'll go out for a, a meal every couple of weeks. A bunch of them went go-karting the other day. We'll go and watch 
go and watch a game in the bar, but we, we met, they hang out with each other's families, but it came from being in this space and there was no, it just yeah. happened naturally over time. And I'm so glad I have that. Here's another That's thing great. is it's local. The gym is 50 minutes that way from where I'm sat now. And That's I think awesome. this is a big thing. We often, a certain time of our life, like college, have loads of friends. Then we move somewhere and we don't have those yes. local friends. And suddenly it's a big it's deal. Hard. Like we're going, have you ever tried to organize a meet up with someone now? It's like you're sending each other 19 different dates. You're doing Google <laughs> polls. Um, yes. There's so many uh, good memes about it. It's the same yeah. thing for women. It's like, especially once you become a mother, it's like impossible to coordinate. It's hysterical. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's a big thing. Local friends is important. And then I would say with your friends that you've maybe dropped or don't see as much as you like, this is like the low hanging fruit. <laughs> I can tell you when I thought was trying to get my social life back on track, it was a big deal for me to reach out to a load of old friends and be like, sorry, I've been a bit AWOL, <laughs> I've been a bit crap. Like, yeah, it'd be great to see you. And I thought they'd be like, oh, screw this guy or they ignore me or you know, but they were like, oh, great. So good to see you. Yeah, let's do it. They all said, yeah, people want to, guys, it's like an aphrodisiac to men when you organize something. They're like, yeah, bah, bah. you know? Like, that is on. so true. Yeah. That is so true. I, I've seen it play out with my husband. Like he has a Sherpa in his group. It is not my husband. I wish it were, but he has been in the Sherpa, uh, Sherpa in the past, which is also interesting how, you know, transitioning into midlife, it kind of drops off your role changes sometimes. Right. But yeah, I mean, he's like amped when he gets that text from the Sherpa in his group. He is psyched. He's like poker with the guys, guys weekend. What, you know, he gets amped. It's yeah. True. People are going to be excited. So, so they're not going to be like, why did he reach out? You know? So send the text. Like I, exactly. I, get, I get sent messages on Twitter, Instagram, people doing like selfies with a load of guys in the background going like, oh, I read your book and I sent a text. Now we're here and we're going to do it amazing, again. That's amazing, Max. It's great. But it also Look shows. You're making a difference. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's so nice. But it also shows it doesn't have to be hugely complex and difficult. Like I'm it sure. starts with a small bit of action. And so I would, that, that's kind of the biggest message I want to get across is what's in your control. There's a lot more than we maybe give it credit for. And then another thing I would say is you kind of got make new friends, catch up with old ones, but the kind of big thing with guys is often you got to have a few friends, a couple of friends beyond your spouse, maybe beyond your female friends who you can talk to about stuff. Yeah. and the best way to get to that point is to role model some vulnerability, right? And vulnerability is one of those words that's so overused in culture now. It's invoked with everything. Yeah. Brene Brown um, put it out there for us, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's the kind of easy way to think about it is it doesn't have to be something, just talk about something that's not going great or just something, start something small. And often the other person will reciprocate because the permissions change in that moment. Exactly. And it, I've had some amazing conversations with people who I never thought could, inverted commas, go there because I went there first. So, you know, you talk about, you talk about going to a therapist, right? You talk about the experience there. It feels like a bit of a leap to share this story with this guy. And he goes, oh, yeah, I've been actually, me, me and my me and my wife have been doing marriage counseling for six months and it turned out after four sessions the counselor said oh i think you've got depression actually i think we should do some one-on-ones right i had no idea about any of that stuff well, i know him way better he's very different to what i thought but it started with just just a small offering so it doesn't have to be a big thing it's like this idea about toolbox you, different tools for different things sometimes be king of banter Put your crown on. <laughs> fang, 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 fang. Right? <laughs> you know, we want to do that. But sometimes you've got to go some different mode. A bit like, and guys can do this because in different parts of their life, with their, you see them with their kids, they're amazing with their kids. Yep. You see them with their it's wife, true. they're amazing with their wife. And then they put it away with the guys. Yeah. Often I remember in your book. <laughs> Yeah, You talked about that in your book, how Naomi would witness you with her and then she'd see you with your friends and be like, why did you talk to him that way? This does not even sound like the man I love, right? Like, yeah, she so said, interesting. do you even like your friends? <laughs> I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> and they were like, I don't think they know. I was like, they know. <laughs> that's so amazing. Yeah, that's that's really good. So Max, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your perception on how how can people actually do a better job of making and deepening friendships that they have at work? Because we do spend so much of our lives at work, whether that's physically in the workplace and in office sitting side by side, or actually just remotely. And so if you have tips to share on how to do that better, I think our audience would benefit from that. Yeah, there's some really interesting research around friendships at at work. Um, And interestingly, you'd think that loneliness at work would be solved by spending more time with one another. But in the research, so for example, remote teams should say they're least satisfied with their friendships at work, um, hybrid teams. Um, but actually, that's not the case. Friendships at work, our struggle with them is not necessarily the amount of contact time we have. It's the sort of contact we have within that time, the sort of conversations that are possible. And often we will show a certain version of ourselves at work because we have to be professional. We have to appreciate people's boundaries. And that can mean that the people don't truly know us and we don't truly know other people. So a lot of making friendships better at work is thinking about how can you repot this friendship? So I think this is a really useful concept and phrase. It's kind of based in the research, but imagine a sapling, you're growing a sapling and you move it to a different pot. You kind of meet someone at work, you kind of get on. There are restrictions there in terms of how you can be, what you can talk about. How can you repot that in a slightly different context? How can you meet them outside of work? How can you say, hey, should we go and grab a grab lunch today? Or do you want to have a coffee around, you know, around the corner? And suddenly in a different context, you have a, a different set of things that are possible between you. And suddenly you can get a sort of relationship that wouldn't be possible outside of that. So that would be my big thing is thinking about if you want stronger friendships at work, you've got to repot them to a different context. Because if you think about often what happens at work, we'll kind of get on really well with people. And we're like, oh, besties forever. <laughs> job. And work, we're like, Bye. Work husband, work wife. Yeah. yeah. No, that does happen. It's painful. It's a loss. I mean, I've been through a couple of layoffs lately and you feel like you're losing. I, I won't say you're losing a family because I can't stand that term used at work ever. But it does. It, it feels painful to lose those connections and not know if they're actually going to survive outside the boundaries of that actual company engagement. Right. And it's important part of the mix is this kind of simple phrase, which is, friends for a reason friends for a season friends for life we need some friends for life right we'll always have friends for a season think about school friends college friends um in your 20s in flat shares or whatever but friends for a reason often that you put work colleagues in there but they can become Mm -hmm. something else but we've got to again be intentional about it and and repot them Mm -hmm. um so that would be i think my advice on on workplace friendships but appreciating like there's a really i think useful metaphor um that comes from jeffrey hall who's a professor at the university of kansas he's done a lot of the friendship research he's got this idea of a social biome so we've got a biome in our gut right which is all the different bacteria very trendy at the moment and it's all about (laughs) variety (laughs) and the different it's all about the balance that kind of what makes it work but we have a social biome so we'll have some really close relationships we'll have some more shallow ones we'll have some more transactional ones uh, like the barista we see every day and we have a bit of a chat, but it's that's what that is. <laughs> and variety is fine. So I think it's about accepting that not every relationship has to be super close, but that we do want really close relationships. Then that kind of repotting concept is a really useful way of thinking about it. I really like that. That's very helpful. You know, I think apart from the concept of of giving your book to a spouse, right? If we notice that they're having a problem making friends or keeping friends, like leaving it on their desk, just, you know, nonchalantly, what else can you advise women who might be witnessing this in their partners uh, to kind of soften the blow? This is a tough topic to broach. And I 
think it could go south very, very quickly. Um, but as you pointed out, there are all sorts of incredible benefits for people to engage in deep friendship. So it's critically important. And for those of us who want to inspire our partners to take a deeper look at his friendships and foster them, do you have do you have any tips for us on how to do this in an elegant, non-offensive way? It's it's a hard conversation to have, but hey, I noticed really, you don't have any friends. It doesn't land well, right? Like, oh. But sometimes, uh, what the guy might need is a space to have the conversation and to confess it. So for mm-hmm. me, I had to say it out loud. I had to go. I'm worried I haven't got any I'm worried I haven't got any friends or I've got way less friends than I used to. And saying it made it real. I'm like, now I feel it's something that I can address. Yeah. And I think having the conversation can be a service to the person. Obviously, you want to do it with emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. But I would say there's something else here, which is sometimes guys, especially if they're dads, or or even if they're if they're not dads, I think there's this idea that that men don't care about relationships, but often men, the men I speak to, they're very aware about, they want to be a modern man. They want to be a good husband. They want to be present. They want to do their fair share around the house and be really good dads, but they also know they want to do well in their career. And they're also trying to stay in shape and all this other stuff. (laughs) And they think, do you know what time for themselves is a bit selfish. And actually people are going to roll their eyes when they go, I'm going to, and gone on a weekend away with the boys. Like, oh, are you? I, I guess I'll have the kids this week. Oh, and often that is not borne out in how the female side of the relationship is thinking about it. They're going, please leave. Please. <laughs> I, like, I, I want to say, please go. Right. But he's thinking, I don't really have permission. And sometimes it's a way of rationalizing it because you don't want to do anything or you're a bit embarrassed by it. Yeah. You don't want to. Have I to think reach sometimes out. having permission. So some, another con- kind of concept I think about is, Couples will often, especially in a long-term relationship, you're busy, uh, you know, you've got a couple of kids. Uh, do you have to put scheduled date nights in to make sure you are having time together? Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. And then over the long run, mm-hmm. things compound. You might be in a difficult place. I mm-hmm. think thinking about a date night for yourself is quite nice. And I don't mean Ooh. you sit alone in the bathroom with some candles. Uh, <laughs> and Although that sounds nice too. You can do that if you want, guys. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> but I mean, you know, thinking it doesn't have to be every week every couple of weeks a date night for yourself where you are going to have some space to see friends and it's really important for you and the thing is so much of this stuff is about being able to to show up in your relationship in a way that's positive so looking after yourself is looking after the relationship if you are happy and you're not you know feeling down all the time because you've got outlets because you're seeing friends you're going to be a better partner if you can go there and be able to have better conversations with your friends you're likely to be able to do that with your spouse so i think this stuff is all interconnected the chances are if you haven't got lots of if you you haven't got a social life you're maybe hiding parts of yourself that your spouse really wants to see Hmm. i think often you think about when we meet our partners or our romantic partners, so much of what we find attractive about them is how they are with other people. We see them across a room and obviously we see them there. Maybe they're find them physically attractive, but it's how they are with people like, Oh, it's hot. (laughs) You know, you've got to be with, we want to see our partners have their life, like have, have their own thing going on, show, show their strengths. Um, And I think, it's important for the relationships. It's about framing it not as you're the guy in the lunch hall eating his lunch by himself, mm. sucking his milk and embarrassed and a you know bit of a loser for one of a better phrase. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean that. I don't mean that's how we should think about that. I mean kind of you know that's yeah. the high school association is that. It's about going. You having a social life is about us, and it would mean a lot to me if you invested in your social life, because I think we'd be better together. And yeah. I think that is what makes it land often often with guys. And then, of course, the point around permission, which I covered earlier. Absolutely. And I think just showing your spouse that you care about his happiness is something that matters, right? And it's just obvious that people with friendships have 
more fulfilling lives. So saying, hey, I care about you. I want you to carve out this space so that you can have this part of your life be full. I think hopefully that lands well for many men. But I do think that we have a culture that is is difficult with the the permission to have these sorts of conversations, which is really unfortunate. I, I do think that we're we're failing our men in a lot of ways in that regard. And I'm so happy that you're out there starting this narrative and pushing the concept of becoming the Sherpa and demystifying friendship and, and really laying bare all that it brings as a benefit socially. And what I found in your book that was so fascinating was it's something that comes naturally to young boys, right? You you spoke fondly of the friendships that you were able to create at your all boys school growing up and how effortless they really were for you and how fluid they were. And then as you got into your teen years, it started to shift a little bit and then it continued to, well, I mean, certainly you had university, which was, was I'm sure a place where you had wonderful friendships too, because of, like we said, the proximity factor and being in the same space with someone and having sustained interactions that fosters friendships, right? But um, it, it's interesting that after that point, uh, it, it starts to kind of drop off. And so it's like the the muscle memory is there for men, right? They've done it. They've been close friends with other men earlier in their lives. So this is possible. It is attainable. Is it, it, it is attainable, but I wouldn't even say it's muscle memory. I would say, what do those places you you name their school, college have in common, you don't have to really think about it because it's all organized for you. There's a whole structure there. Mm. You just show up. You're in your <laughs> halls. You go to lectures. You attend yeah. your club that you signed up for in the Freshers' Fair. Like, yeah. And I think that's what happens is men don't learn the social initiative and they leave these spaces. And when they're untethered, mm. they're like, I don't know what to do. Help. <laughs> so we have to go, oh, I'm now middle-aged and I have to, it's like a management problem. It's like, oh, I have to think about this now. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the leap, but also going, I think sometimes we think friendships should happen naturally. And when they don't happen naturally, it's because something's going wrong. As in the person we just saw is the wrong person or it will just happen, mm -hmm. but it doesn't as an adult, <laughs> you have to actually do something. I mean, one of the biggest things is I, I talk about at the end of the book, three things show up when you're asked. That's a massive thing. People start showing up to stuff. Hey, do you want to come to this barbecue? Uh, come out for a drink. Uh, people mm. don't go, stop showing up. And then you start being invited. So show up yep. when you're asked and the instinct so is often, Oh, I can't be bothered. It's inconvenient. Show up. Second thing is go first when you're not asked. So be the one who organizes something. And the third thing is keep going even when it's hard. Because another thing about adulthood is that often people get busy and when they don't reply or they're a bit evasive, we think, oh, they don't like me or, oh, yeah. they're a dick. The truth <laughs> is, it's just a mess. It's just yeah. a bloody mess. So you've got to keep going even when it's a bit tricky and the follow-ups. I mean, you think about, we would, I mean, we were talking about you know, working in biz dev and, and, and new business. And think about it, if you're trying to onboard a new client or chase a sale, you have a whole process. You're doing follow-ups. You're kind of working it all out. If we ran our social life with the same diligence, creativity, and structure that we ran our business life, everyone would have amazing social lives. But we think so it operates under a completely different set of rules and it should just go poof, it's there. Yeah, that's not how it works. It's not right. magic. We all have to kind of rise up and, and grow into the role of CEO of our own social life. And I think you've just given us some really great instructions on how to get there. And that applies for men and women. Like all the mm. things that you just mentioned, it's, it's genderless, right? And it, it, being a better friend makes you get better friendships. And what you've described too is really just how to show up as a friend. And people are attracted to that, right? So Great tips. I think everyone that listens into this episode will take away some really constructive things that they can implement today. And I really, I love your book. I think it's something that a lot more people need to read. And so I'm going to definitely link the uh, link the book in the show notes so people can go and check it out. Um, Max, if people want more Max Dickens, where can they go to find him? Well, my address is, uh, no. Uh, so... <laughs> 
where can you go and find me? So my website is maxdickens.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well, Max Dickens Writes. On Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. Come say hello on LinkedIn if you've if you've found this through that platform. I often post lots of um, practical tips and kind of emerging stories around friendship, around men and masculinity. I'm working on this thing called the in-between man at the moment. I mentioned this idea earlier about that's how I identify. I'm kind of this in-between man. I think it's a, a good metaphor and frame of where of where a lot of men are at at the moment. If you kind of want to explore that, I'll be posting about that a lot in the next few months. I definitely want to learn more about the in-between man. And as I rem- remember, it's in between like Harvey Weinstein and something else. Maybe share a little <laughs> bit about that because I don't believe we, we covered that during the recording. <laughs> oh, uh, we're, we're in between, um, you know, our dads and ah. this kind of amalgamation of new guy that we keep hearing about in, mm. in social posts and in, in magazines. We're kind of in between that. And we don't really know how we feel about it. And sometimes we feel a bit short of resources. We feel like our our skill or our abilities go below our level of aspirations in certain ways. Mm. And that kind of muddling through in the in the messy middle, doing your best. That's the thing where a lot of blokes are at. And I want more stories told about these guys and not just the absolute monsters and not just the completely... <laughs> completely different com- totally evolved guys because on both yeah. ends of the spectrum i think a lot of guys don't find them particularly relatable i love that that's fantastic i think that's an incredible service that you're doing for men in society so thanks for having the guts and the courage to do this i mean this was this had to have been hard to stand out and say stand up and say i'm i'm going to write this book i'm going to take on this particular platform so kudos to you for for fighting the good fight Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak to your audience. Thank you, Max. 